Today is part two. Today, we're starting part two of a message series I started last week called Habits. And two things I want to mention before I even begin. One is that the recording quality has not been good at the church for a few weeks. We have really, really battled to get our lighting, to get our audio. So I'm telling you this in case you're one of the people that watches the message online afterwards. You might have noticed there's a slight quality difference from what you're seeing now or from what you're used to seeing. We are working our hardest to get that right. The other thing is I want to just send a shout out to Life Church because they are so open-handed with their resources as a church. And we, we love what they do. Uh, Craig Rochelle and his team uh, at Life Church and, and even this particular series, Habits, comes out of their church and they're open-handed with the resources. And uh, I just thought this is exactly where we need to go. And so uh, I wanted to just thank them for that. They are a massive blessing in the life of the church, not just to their church, but to the church globally. And, uh, and so I wanted to mention that. So now part one was on last week. It wasn't a super high quality. If you missed it, check it out, watch it. Just sit through the 480p resolution, okay? Sit through the slight missing of the lip syncing. Just sit through it. The, probably the easiest way to listen to last week's message is just to listen to last week's message, okay? Then you're not going to worry about the lip syncing or anything else, but take a listen to it because there was something very specific that I wanted you to hear in and around all of this stuff that I was talking about habits. And it was Sarah and my heart for you and for this church and for this community. I wanted that to come across extremely clearly that the reason we do what we do the reason we pour who we are into this church and into this community as much as we love doing that, the reason we love doing that is quite simple. We want to see as many people as possible in relationship with Jesus, and we want to see them becoming more like him. Honestly, that is the sincere motive of our hearts for everything that we do. We want to see that, and I know a lot of you uh, have that exact same motivation in your own lives, and I'm hoping that you picked that up from last week because this isn't just a change a habit message, find this, break this, but you need to hear that, that we want more than anything for people to fall in love with Jesus and to be becoming more like him each and every week. And, and I think that sounds great. I hope it does. I hope it sounds like something good and something you'd like and something you want. But we realized last week it doesn't happen all at once. As much as we say we want people to fall in love with Jesus and begin to live like he did, we know that it just doesn't happen all at once. And there was a phrase that I shared last week, and it's the key to this thing. It's small changes done consistently over time that have big results. And so last week we spoke about maybe one or two habits that you're thinking about embracing for this year. How did that go? Show me with your head. How did that go? Anyone embrace a habit last week? And it's already over. <laughs> Anyone do that? It's not easy. It's not easy to do, but it's small changes done consistently over time that bring big results. And the problem we saw is that with every single new habit you're gonna start, you're gonna run into the same wall. Do you remember what that wall is? I'm not seeing progress fast enough. I'm just not seeing the results I want fast enough, whether it's exercising every week or spending consistent time with God or being a better husband or a better father or attending church more regularly um, or, or not snacking. I'm just not seeing the results I wanna see fast enough. Whenever we wanna start a good habit or stop a bad one, that's the wall we run into, which is why New Year's resolutions don't normally last until Valentine's Day. We get discouraged. We don't see the results. But I wanna tell you, don't give up. Don't give up. Small changes consistently over time produce big results. And we need to bear in mind Paul's advice from Galatians 6 verse nine that said, let's not get tired of doing good. Don't grow weary, don't grow tired. I know that it's difficult, but don't give up. Let's not grow tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And I'm encouraging you with this series, with this year, with the one thing that you may be gonna choose at the end of this message to put into practice, 
Don't get tired of doing good because at exactly the right time, you're gonna reap a harvest of blessing, but only if you don't give up. Remember what I said last week, water only boils at 100 degrees. Until then, it's hot. 99 degrees is hot. And you know what? 34 and 35 degrees, guess what? They look the same. They feel more or less the same. You're not gonna tell me that you know the difference between 34 and 35 degrees by feel. You're not gonna convince me of that. It looks the same, it feels the same, but it's not the same. And then 37 degrees and 38 and 39, and you know what, the water looks exactly the same in the kettle or in the pot on the stove until it clicks over from 99 degrees until it's 100 degrees. And then it moves from very hot to boiling. And so what I'm trying to tell you is keep going, keep at it. I know what I'm asking you is not an easy thing. When we're talking about habits, they must be one of the hardest things to make and break in anyone's life. But if you keep pushing, the needle will move and it will go from 30 to 40 to 50 and eventually it will tick over from 99 to 100. And you'll find that you have momentum and a habit that's healthy in that area. Does that make sense? That's more or less where we went last week. But I'd still encourage you, if you didn't watch it, if you didn't listen to it, go and do that. Today is gonna be even more, I think, practical than last week. And I want you to think about this. Where your life is going right now, where you're heading if you keep doing what you're doing right now in every area, maybe in your finances, as a husband, as a wife, as a Christian, uh, as an employer, as an employee, as a, as a businessman, where is your life gonna be going? Are, are you happy with the, the destination? If things carry on exactly like they are right now, are you gonna be where you wanna be in five years time? Or do you go, I don't wanna be here in five years time. I don't wanna be doing this stuff again in five years time. I need to be making progress in an area in five years time. If I'm still in this place financially, this, this, this debt financially in five years time, I've got problems. I don't wanna be in that space anymore. And I think a lot of us would say, we don't wanna be in this place in five years time. That there's something more. And I want you to think about this because if you wanna change where you're going in, your, in life, or you wanna change who you're becoming in life, you have to change your habits. You have to change your habits. Most studies show that about 40% of what you do every single day is purely habit. It has, you don't even make choices on it anymore. You get up and you know what you do. You hit snooze, I know me, I can tell you my routine. I don't think about it anymore. I hit snooze twice every day, it's what I do. Sara goes, can you just get up? And I go, I've got a system. I hit snooze twice, then I get up, okay? And, and I do that on purpose. I set my alarm two snoozes early so that I'm up at the right time. That's how I work. So I, that is a real thing. <laughs> Who's clapping there? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> It's, it's a thing, I've got a system. So I do that and then I get up and I, you know, probably bathroom or something. And then I go and I make breakfast for the girls and then I, I, I've got a very set thing that I'm basically on autopilot for. And then you get to work and there's some fresh challenges but even some of that is a little bit autopiloty. And then I, have you ever found yourself back in your garage at home? How did I get you again? Because your life is, is just built on habit after habit after habit. It's just the, it's the way that we all are. We love those patterns, those systems, those habits, and once they become entrenched, it can be difficult because not all of them are just neutral, like snoozing. Some of them are the habits. What do I do? I'm at home. Fridge, what's there? Hello, let's eat. Snack cupboard, there you are. Sometimes it's just a habit that we do, that we get into. Okay, it's nine o'clock, the kids are down. What's the habit? Netflix, and no, just Netflix. Whatever, but you've got habits that you're doing all the time and they're just some good, some bad, some neutral, some healthy, some unhealthy, but most of us, 40%, at, at least 40% of what we do is just basically autopilot. And so if you wanna change who you are becoming and where you are going, you have to change your habits. That's why this series is so important. Because here's the thing, most people have the same goals. You may not have thought about this. Probably almost every single person in this room and who's listening has more or less the same goals. If you're a Christian, the chances are one of your goals is to have a closer walk with God, right? 
We've got that goal. Most of the people in this room have got that goal. Most of us want to be healthier. Most of us want some financial freedom. We want some financial margin. We, I don't know anyone who says, my goal in life is really to be, oh, I don't know, kind of drowning in debt. I don't know anyone who says that because we all have the same sort of goal and it's financial freedom. We want some margin. We, just, we don't just want enough to survive. We want enough to be generous and to be giving and to have a little bit extra as well. We want that margin with our finances. Most of us want to have good relationships. We all have similar goals, but we have dramatically different results. So you can have the same goal as the person next to you, but somehow they're hitting it and you're not. Why? How come some people are getting this and are getting the body they desire and are getting the finances they desire and are getting the opportunities they desire? We've got the same goals here, but I'm not reaching the same targets. Why? Well, James Clear, he's one of the authors, he actually wrote a book called Atomic Habits, and he said this, which is fascinating, and I think it's a good answer to this question. Goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. Having the goal doesn't mean you're going to be successful in it. In other words, knowing the destination isn't what gets you there. I want to get to Cape Town. Congratulations. Tell me when you get there. You know? No, no. Knowing the destination isn't the thing. The steps between here and Cape Town are the important. That's what's actually going to get me to the destination. It's not goals that determine success. It's systems that determine success. And I would argue that Daniel, anyone know Daniel from the Bible? What do you think of? Lion's Den, of course, claim to fame. Um, and it's a pretty incredible thing that happened in that story, but that's not the part of the story of Daniel that I want to highlight. I would argue that Daniel was a systems person, that Daniel had a system. And some of you know the story of Daniel. Some of you, you've, you've been in church a long time. You've been in Sunday school maybe in the past. We don't call it that anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. And some of you just, ah, Daniel, yeah, no, I've heard about him. Definitely the lion guy, but that's about all I know. Let me give you a little background, just a little, because I want you to see that he actually had systems. And I'm going to see the value of those systems in a moment. But here's Daniel and, uh, and, and the, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, consistently rebelled against God. And I mean consistently. There is just a pattern and a cycle in the Bible of God help us, and then God helps them. And then they, ah, we don't need you anymore. And then they get captive, and they, they fall into their own sin, and they become an absolute mess. And then they say, oh, God help us, and God helps them. And then they, it's just a cycle that carries on so many times. And eventually, God had had enough. And he said, you're going to cry out, and I'm not going to be there this time. And basically, that's what happened. As the nation split into two and both of them at separate times were taken into exile, they were dominated or conquered by other lands, the Babylonians and the Persians. They, so, so they were completely almost enslaved. And the Babylonians would have this thing where they would go into a nation and they would take all of the best and brightest. They would take the sharp young minds. They would take the people who would be good and fit in an army, the people who were educated and who had something to offer their economy, and they'd leave all the old, sick, and like, they, they, you stay here. You stay where we found you, but we're taking the cream of the crop back to us, and we're going to make our place stronger because of them. And that's exactly what they did. And so they took Daniel and a whole bunch of other Israelites who were of, you know, noble standing or had wealth or had education, whatever it might have been. They took them through there and they began to, to almost process them to becoming more like Babylonians. I'm going to teach them. We're going to school them how we eat, how we pray. These are our gods. This is it. We're going to somehow indoctrinate you into becoming Babylonian. And Daniel and his mates, and you all know them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know the story of them worshiping the idol, probably the statue. And so they rose above everyone else. Everyone that was brought in from the nation of Israel, they stood up head and shoulders above them. They were more qualified. They made better decisions. They were wiser. They, they, they just did, they, their workmanship was impeccable. And so they were set as leaders leading over another nation, but they were the captured nation. How do you think it made the leaders of that nation feel? Jealous. Totally jealous. 
And so they looked for a way to destroy particularly Daniel. They looked for a way to just bring him down because this, wasn't, this isn't working. You are not even from here and you are telling us what to do. This isn't working for us. And so they looked and the Bible says they scrutinized every single thing that he did. It would be like someone job shadowing you but from a little bit of a distance. He didn't pick up that paper as he walked in. Oh, he didn't greet that person. Oh, he didn't answer that email. Oh, I saw that workmanship that he did on the pavement. Shocking. It would be like someone scrutinizing you day in and day out and looking for any weakness, any flaw, anything that you did wrong. And you know what the Bible says? Nothing. They could not find anything. Not one thing. His workmanship was perfect. His communication, his leadership, everything that he did was of such a high standard, no one could say anything negative about Daniel. That's incredible. I don't know if that would be the same if they were job shadowing me or you or anyone else. That is like, whoa. But that's the caliber of person we're talking about. So they figured that the only way to actually get to Daniel was to get to his God. It's the only thing, there's, there's something there that maybe we can exploit. There's something there that we can use as a weakness. He sees it as a strength, but I think we can use it as a weakness. So of course, they approach the king and they say, oh, king, you're so amazing. Yes, I am. No one else should be worshipped but you. That sounds good. Let's put it in writing. I like it. And he put it in writing. No one else could be worshipped. No one else could be revered or prayed to or anything like that. And then they had it. Aha. Why did they do that? Because they know Daniel doesn't pray to the king. And they know Daniel doesn't pray privately either. He plays publicly where everyone can see him. So this was the perfect way to catch him breaking a brand new law. But listen to what it says in Daniel 6 verse 10. It says this, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down, listen to these two words, as usual. As usual. It's not, oh God, I'm in a crisis. Um, I need to come to you right now. No, it's not talking about that. It's as usual in his room upstairs, with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day and listened to this, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. You see a pattern here. You see something that's shaping his life in an incredible way. What did Daniel do? Three times, every single day, not when it was convenient, not when it was a crisis, but he had a habit, he had a pattern, he had a system of spending time alone with God three times every day, intimate fellowship with his maker, intimate fellowship with his creator. He had a habit, one small system, one small discipline, one small habit. And I wanna say to you, never underestimate what God can do with one small habit. Don't underestimate what God can do. You think, how big is that? I also pray once or three times, twice a day, most days ish. Don't underestimate what God can do with one small habit. Because that's what we're talking about this morning is we're saying, okay, cool, we need something that's going to take us closer to God, that's going to shape and transform us. What one small thing, and you say, that's so small. Don't underestimate what God can do with one small step. In fact, I'm 41 now, and I've walked with Jesus I think just over 20 years, and there are some small things that I started to do along the way. There are some small things that over the 20 years I've begun to put into practice that, that were not habits, that became habits in my life, that have honestly shaped me to who I am now. Now, I realized a long time ago that I had to be more disciplined to get closer to God. I realized that no one just stumbles into intimacy with God. It doesn't just happen. You don't put up your hand one service and then the, the, the Monday comes and you are just, you and God are like super tight. No one stumbles into intimacy with God. It just doesn't happen. I thought it worked like that. I thought if I prayed the prayer on a Sunday or, or on a Friday at youth, I thought surely God's gonna be with me. This is gonna be like such an amazing ride. And then it, it didn't take long before I realized, well, intimacy with God doesn't just happen. It's actually gonna take some effort on my part. No one accidentally becomes more faithful or more prayerful or more mature with God. 
And I can tell you this before I get into some things is that I am not where I want to be, not by the longest shot, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be either. And I think most of us can say that. And you know what? That's a good thing. You may not be where you want to be, but praise God, you're not where you used to be. Praise God, he's taken you forward and he's definitely taken me forward. And what I want to do is share just a couple Just a couple of those small decisions, those small habits, those small systems that I and myself and SARS have put into practice over the years. And you're gonna see something. Years ago, to mention what Sarah spoke about earlier, years ago, I started the spiritual discipline of tithing. Very simple, one discipline. And it works like this. Anytime God blesses me, I choose in that moment to honor him and put him first. That's it. It's not that hard. Any, that's, that's how we work. Anytime God blesses us, that moment we choose to honor him, to put him first. And you know what? It's a constant reminder that God is my source. He's my provider. And so I worship him with a tithe gladly. That's a habit that no, is no longer negotiable in our house. We don't sit there from month to month going, what do you think? a bit of a tight one. Uh, What do you think? Maybe half. It's half to it this month. We don't sit there like that because it's it's something we established more than two decades ago. So it's just one of those things. Years ago with SARS, we made a decision, we made a choice that we would worship God every week at church, that we would be a church that that attends church, sorry, a family that attends church. Even when we go on holiday, and you can ask SARS and you can ask our kids, they don't always love it. (laughs) They don't always love it, but it doesn't matter where we are on holiday. If there is a church nearby, we're going there. It's not a discussion of, should we go this week? I don't know. Maybe we can have a little holiday from church. That would be exciting. We're not looking for a holiday from church. If we're there on a Sunday, we'll find a church because we're people of God and it's a priority to us. That's just how it works. That's that's something that's gotten into us. It's a system that we know helps us. Years ago, I decided that I need to read God's Word every day. Doesn't need to be a lot, but I knew that I need to start reading God's Word every day. And so I tried, and I failed. But I tried again, and I failed again. And that was a real pattern in my life for the longest time as a, as a new Christian. I would say that possibly that was one of the hardest habits so far is to get consistently into God's word every single day. And I kept trying. And what ended up helping me was reading the Bible in a year. That was something that, that began to help me with my journey on this. And, and so right now I read the Bible from cover to cover just about every year. I say just about... <laughs> because it takes me a year and three months to read a year's Bible. (laughs) Okay, why? Because I haven't mastered the discipline yet. Because I'm not all there. If you look at my Bible plan, and I'm still catching up from 2022, I'm about 67 days missed. Okay? It just sometimes works like that. Now, I'd like to get to the point where I could do a Bible in a year. I I haven't done it yet. But, But what I have done is... I can tell you now in all sincerity, I've, I've read through the Bible cover to cover many, many times. Why? Because I realized that this was an important thing that I needed to do. This was something, this is the only way that I can get to know who God is and to get to know his word was by doing this in a routine thing. And here's the thing, with all the habits that I've mentioned, there's not one small discipline that's made me a better dad. There's not one of these things that have made me a better Christian or a better father or a better husband. But one small thing over time, a bunch of these small things over time, and I find that I am a better husband, that I am a better father, that I am a better believer, that I am a better leader. It's not one big thing that makes the change. One small habit done consistently over time has the big results. Week after week, month after month, year after year. That's how our marriage has changed. That's how our finances have changed. That's how my health has changed. That's how my walk with God has changed. And I'm not who I want to be. So do not hear what I'm not saying. If I've conquered this many habits, I've got this many to go. 
So I'm not where I want to be, but I'm so grateful to God that I'm not where I used to be. I want to improve to do better in all these areas, but I'm going to share with you my one thing because I want you to begin to think about your one thing this year. No one's asking you to change everything. No one's asking you to make the big dramatic changes. Saying if you can get one small habit in place and you can be consistent over time with this, I think it can make a real difference in your life. And here's my one for this year. Are you ready? My personal goal for 2023. I want to become, are you waiting for a joke? I can't tell. I feel like everyone's like, is he going to, he's joking here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> I want to become a better leader. That's it. So that's my goal. That's what I want to become. That's the who of what I want to be. I want to become a better leader. I want to be more prepared, more equipped, more efficient, more focused. I want to be a better leader this year than I was last year. And here's what I know about leaders. Leaders are... It rhymes. I'm a preacher. You gotta, if it doesn't rhyme, it's not even real. Leaders are readers. And that is the fact of the matter. You can read any, any, uh, any leader you admire in the world, whether he's Christian or not, and you're going to find something out very quickly. They're a reader. And if they don't read, they do audio books. One way or another, they get information into them on a common or uh, consistent basis. And so leaders are readers, and my goal is to be a better leader this year. Now, I do enjoy reading. I don't struggle. I'm not like, like it's not a, a massively difficult. I enjoy reading. But I seem to have this bad habit of not finishing certain books. Give me a crime book, something with blood and guts and that sort of stuff, and there's like a horror and, or something. Someone's got to do it. We're too early on that picture. Put it back. Give me, give me a thriller. Give me detectives. No problem. I'll finish that book in two days. Give me Hunger Games. Pocket change. I get through it in a minute. Easy stuff. There's some games, uh, some, some books I just really enjoy. Get through them quickly. But you give me a leadership book. Wow. And some of you are so kind. <laughs> I've got such a, a list of books. And, and I have such good intentions, I swear, to get through them. But there's something about them that, yes, hey, because my, my reading time is nighttime. That's how it's always been. But I think even there, something's wrong. Leadership books, wow, I find them difficult. So I've got a pile, and that's the picture. That, that is just next to my bed. That's not in, the, in the, um, the bookcase, and it's not under my thing. These are leadership books that I have, and, and those are legitimately my bookmarks in all of them. Okay, that is legitimately where I am in all of those books. And so if you ever get a half-baked idea, you know why. I never finished the chapter. <laughs> okay, but th that's literally how my life goes. And, and if you, I know some of you are studying those books to see if there's anything dodgy there. There's not. But, but these are literally just uh, books that I've started uh, that I want to carry on reading, that I want to finish. If you look there, I mean, this is ridiculous. I once spoke to a pastor friend of mine, and I said, I don't know what's going on here. I've got so many unfinished books. And he said, yeah, I've got a book for you. I was like, come on. <laughs> but he did. And it was this one there, Turn the Page, How to Read Like a Top Leader. <laughs> how ironic that I got like a third of the way into How to Read Like a Top Leader. <laughs> And it's still lying there. I'm like, thanks, Grant. Really appreciate that. Um, I don't think you understood the severity of the problem, though. <laughs> or you would have bought me an audio book. Okay. So there's, there's, believe me, there's, there's another pile of about 10 uh, that I couldn't even fit into that photo. It is a problem. And so this year, you can take that off before, you know, <laughs> makes me look bad. There's a problem, but there's a point, and that's the thing. I've got a long way to go with this particular goal. I've got a long way to go before this one small step is gonna actually improve my leadership. But I know, and it's not about, ah, if the book doesn't grip you, just move on to the next one. There's such gems in those books, but it's about me mining them out of those books. And I know that I'm not getting all the value that I could. Having the goal to finish reading those leadership books isn't enough. 
It's not gonna get me there. Remember what we said, goals don't determine success, systems determine success. It's not the goal of finishing the books. What's the system that's gonna get me to the finish line in terms of this? And maybe think about this for yourself. What goal do you have this year? What goal do you have this year? And what system is gonna get you there? Daniel had a system. Three times a day, every day, he'd get on his knees before God and he would have intimate fellowship with his creator, just as he'd done before. Isn't it awesome? So never underestimate how God can take something so small and turn it into something so big and so special and so significant. And here, and I'm gonna end with this now, with this part of things, is that I wanna get even more practical because now we're speaking about habits, we're speaking about goals, but here's where I wanna get even more practical because now this, this is for you, this is for me. It's not just about picking a habit and it's not even just about picking a goal. I want your goal to be about who you want to become. So it's not what you want to achieve, it's who you want to become. Did you hear my goal for the year? It's to be a better leader. It's not what I wanna achieve. My goal isn't to read 20 books. My goal is a who goal. And what I'm encouraging you to do today is to figure out who you wanna be, who God is calling you to be. And this year, who is it? Who do you wanna be? It's important that we ask the question, who does God want me to become this year? Does God want me to become a godly parent this year? Maybe you've battled with that and you know that's the who God wants you to become. Does God want me to be a bold witness this year? Does God want me to be a diligent student this year? Does he want me to be a person who's healthy this year? Someone who's clean? Someone who isn't dependent on, on drugs or alcohol or cigarettes? Does he, is that what God wants for me? Who does God want me to be? It's only then that the habits come in. And here's the question you're gonna ask yourself right now. Based on who you wanna become, what one habit do you need to start? Based on becoming a better leader, what one habit am I choosing? Listen, I can choose a 100 habits. I can chase conferences, I can listen to podcasts, I can do all sorts of things, but the one habit that I'm embracing this year that's gonna develop me as a leader is reading and finishing what I read because that gives me a better chance of implementing what I read. And so what one small habit or discipline do you need to start to become the person you wanna become? And I wanna encourage you, start small. Maybe you wanna be a more disciplined Christian. So you choose as your habit, Bible first. Before Instagram, before Facebook, before emails, before work, I read my, my daily Bible plan. Maybe that's your, your goal is I wanna be a more disciplined Christian, your habit that will get you there or at least some of the way there is Bible first. Maybe you wanna be a person who's more organized. What's your one small habit? Make your bed every morning. What? That's ridiculous. I choose that one. Anyone else? Like, I choose that. I can do that. No problem. Okay, that one isn't gonna hurt me. It's not gonna cost me. I can make my bed every morning. But you know what? What happens when you wake up in the morning and things are late and disorganized? How good is the rest of your day? You hit the snooze three times instead of two. And then you're up a little later, and now the pressure's on. And now the wife, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> there's pressure to make breakfast, and there's not enough time, and so you're getting irritable, so you're shouting at the kids, and then the dogs are running under your feet, and then you, you've got all sorts of stuff that you just like, and it's like, come on. And, and guess what, your, your, your day just becomes frantic and chaotic. You wanna be a more organized person. Is that the who God's calling you to be? Then what's the small habit that you can implement? Make your bed every morning. Because you start off with time, with organization. You're telling yourself, I'm an organized person. I've left the room to do this. And then you get on with your day. Does that mean, so small. But you know what, don't underestimate one small thing. Do that consistently, it becomes a habit. You never have to think about it again. Move on to the next one. You wanna be a person who's a godly example to your children, right? So every day, what's your small habit you can do? Maybe do a devotional with them. 10 minute devotional before bed, something I've been thinking about, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You want to be a person who's more focused. Maybe you are scatterbrained.com. Maybe it always looks like your, your thoughts and brain was in a blender every morning, and it's just like, what? what? You just don't know what, what's happening. Get to work, have a small piece of paper, and write down the top three priorities that you need to accomplish that day. You need to be, it's who do I want to be? What's going to get me there? It's not the only thing that's going to get me there, but it's one thing I can do this year consistently over time, and it will produce big results. Based on who you want to become, what one habit do you need to start? What new system do you need that's going to take you to where God wants you to be? And here's the phrase that I think is going to help you form a new habit loop in your life to get you to the who God wants you to become. Okay. Now, if you talk about practical, it doesn't get more practical than this. Here's the phrase I want you to hear. I want you to say, and if you've got a camera, write it, or, or take a photo. If you've got something to write with, write it. It's this. I will blank after I blank. I will do this, this, or I will do this after I that. Why is this so important? Because this is concrete. This gives you an action and a time frame. So I want to be a more, I want to be a more emotionally connected father. I will tell my children I love them after I put them to bed. Make sense? It's not a big thing. But you know what that does? It gives you a small, concrete hook every single day. I want to be a more conscientious uh, tither or giver. I will give after I get paid. I want to be more disciplined in my devotional life. I will read my Bible plan after I wake up. It's just the action, the time frame. And you know what, if you've got those things, it's massively helpful. And so I'm encouraging you, whatever that looks like for you, however you do that, however you rem remind yourself of that, keep that in the front of your mind. People who are close to God are not there by accident. They didn't stumble there. They've got small disciplines that draw them close to Him. People who are financially strong don't just get there because of an inheritance. I can tell you that. They don't buy whatever they feel like buying when they go into spa and see the chocolate aisle. People who are in shape, it does not just happen. It takes a plan, it takes a lot of small steps consistently over time. Remember what I said, we've all got similar goals, but we have very different results. So none of us have got goal problems. We've got systems problems. And I'm gonna end with that thought and I ask, Avril, thank you. If you can come up, we're going to end the service. And this is important for you to know. We don't have goals problems. We have systems problems. But here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. In fact, why don't you stand with me as we... Because as you think of... Remember, I encourage you to think of who you want to become, not what you want to do. Start with the who, then work on the do. So who do you want to become? Who do you believe that God is calling you to become this year, what change do you need to make come second? But who is the important thing? And I want to encourage you with this thought that there's only one who that's worth pursuing and that's worth becoming like. No matter what your goal is for the year, no matter the, the who you want to become, all of your goals need to lead you to the ultimate goal, which is to be more like Jesus. If your who doesn't line up with becoming more like Jesus, choose another who. Because that's the most important thing. Being a loving father, absolutely, because that actually lines up with becoming more like Christ. Being a more attentive husband. Being more disciplined. Being healthier. All those things that we've mentioned, all the things that are going through your own head, as long as they line up under and behind the most important who, that you would want to become more like Jesus. Just asking you to be a little more specific than that, that's all. Your goals don't mean anything if they answer that you can be used more for His glory. And so I'm trusting and praying that even now the Holy Spirit is just speaking to you about the who you want to become this year. And Father, as people are wrestling with that, Lord, I pray that you would do something deep and something concrete, Lord God, 
that the who they would want to become this year would ultimately be to become more like Christ, but in a specific sense that you would help them to know the who you would want them to become. And what is it that you want them to, to be this year a little better than they were last year? God, we pray for your hand. We pray for your help in this in Jesus' name. Pray, Lord God, as this is a church that just starts, starts healthy habits, that each one of us would be further along next year than we were this year because we've managed to take a small change consistently over time and see a big result. We thank you and we pray for this in Jesus' name. Well, I hand over to Sarah while your eyes are still closed and your heads are bowed. I wanna invite you even in this moment, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, to invite Him into your life. We've been talking about starting new habits, and I think some of you need to start a new relationship with Jesus. What does that mean? Well, I grew up hearing about Jesus, but He was distant and He was impersonal. And it was only later in life that I learned that He is actually personal, that He has a deep love for me personally. And maybe you're here today, and if you're being honest, you know that you just don't have that walk with Him. You're not following Jesus. He's not your Lord. He's not your Savior. He's not leading your life. So how do you make Him the Lord of your life? The Bible says you simply confess your sin to Him. You ask Him for His forgiveness. And then you decide to follow Him. It's a journey I started 20 odd years ago. Many of us even in this room, have been a lot longer than me. But you take that first step and you allow God to be the leader and the Lord of your life. This is one change that will lead to an eternal difference. If you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm gonna ask you in a moment just to raise your hand. I'd love to pray with you and lead you to Him in this moment. After that, I'm gonna ask that you would when everyone goes to the cafe, stick around. Just let someone pray with you for a moment. But if that's you, here's step number one. You know you're not following Jesus, but you want to. Then can I ask that in this right now, every head's bowed, every eye is closed. Would you raise your hand? Let me know that you're in here right now. If you wanna follow Jesus from today onwards, God bless you. Is there anyone else this morning who says, that's me, I definitely need that. God bless you, thank you. Anyone else, God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Five hands I think that I've seen so far. Anyone else before I pray? Thank you at the back. Thank you, I see you. Then let's pray. And let's trust God to do something supernatural on the inside of you. Nothing changes on the outside, but on the inside, you are a whole new person. On the inside, you become a son or a daughter of God. On the inside, you are forgiven and set free. On the inside, you surrender and submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus and begin to live for Him. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Son, Jesus, who died in my place, taking my punishment so that I could live so that I could be forgiven. God, forgive me and make me new. I surrender my life, every part of it, to you. I put it in your hands. I wanna follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank God for what he's doing? Come on.